The K63 wireless mechanical gaming keyboard from Corsair can connect to your computer via ultra-fast 1 millisecond 2.4 gigahertz wireless technology or low latency Bluetooth and features per-key blue LEDs, 15 hours of gameplay on a single charge, and genuine Cherry MX switches. It's lapboard ready too, so click the sponsor link in the description for more information. Excellent! Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to Paul's Hardware. This is my first how to build a computer video for 2018. It's 2018 and if you want to build a computer to play some video games or just to build your own computer because it's a lot of fun, you've come to the right place. This is a beginner's guide so I'm going to be walking you through everything step by step, starting with actually choosing the parts to put into your new computer. The part that I'm featuring today is AMD's newest APU, that's Accelerated Processing Unit. That includes a CPU as well as a GPU. Uh, which is your graphics card, as well as your central processor in the same unit, which means you don't have to buy a graphics card, which right now is a very good thing because graphics cards are very expensive. Before I get too far ahead of myself though, let's start off by running down all the parts that I'm gonna be using in today's build. So there are eight main components to a computer or a desktop computer that you're gonna build yourself, starting with what holds everything together. That's right over here and that's the motherboard. Now this is a mini ITX motherboard, which means it's very small. Form factor is important. The form factor of your motherboard, Mini ITX in this case, is going to impact what case you choose. So if you want something small, Mini ITX is the way to go for the motherboard, and we're gonna be choosing a Mini ITX case here in just a while as well. You wanna make sure that the socket at the center here is compatible with your processor. So the socket we're using today is AMD's AM4 socket, and that is, of course, compatible with our AMD Ryzen 3 2200G APU, so it's gonna slot in right there. You've also got some other slots in here for memory, for example, over on this side, as well as places to plug in power, as well as some uh, connectors for storage, and we'll get into that as we actually start the build. Next up is our processor. So this here is our 2200G from AMD, and again, this is both a quad-core CPU, as well as a graphics card, not a graphics card, but your graphics uh, capabilities are integrated into that as well. This is a PGA or pin grid array processor. So there's a bunch of little pins on the bottom and that's what slots into the socket on the motherboard. And they're very delicate. So they can be slightly bent. You wanna try not to touch them with your fingers if you can. If you do bend them, don't worry, they can be bent back into place. Uh, but it's best just to be really careful with that so you don't end up actually bending them. Now your processor is gonna warm up when it actually is in use. So it's gonna wanna be able to stay cool. For that, you're gonna need a CPU cooler. AMD includes a CPU cooler. This is called the Wraith Stealth in the box. Um, so you can use this and that's what we're gonna be using today to keep the price down because uh, $99 for the 2200G plus a cooler hey, that's a pretty good deal. And you get a graphics card in there as well. Now you're also gonna need some storage uh, for your system. And we have a couple different options for that here. These are both SSDs or solid state drives. You can also use a mechanical drive, although mechanical drives are a bit slower. I typically only recommend those for mass storage right now. Uh, these are smaller. So here is gonna be your budget friendly option. This is a 240 gig SSD. And this is typically what I recommend for anyone who's building a new system. 240 gigs will give you enough space for your operating system, uh, as well as some apps and games and it's gonna be nice and fast to keep your system very responsive. Might not be the same drive I have listed done in the video's description today, so just check them there. I'll have a solid 240 gig-ish drive that you can buy that will get the job done for you. Now, if you wanna upgrade and get yourself a lot faster storage, this is not necessary by any stretch for today, but the next generation of SSDs are gonna look kinda of like this kind of like a stick of gum, but this is an M.2 drive, which refers to the actual connector here. And the cool thing about that is it can actually uh, mount directly to your motherboard. So this motherboard has an M.2 slot on the bottom. It is also an NVMe connection. So you wanna double check and make sure that your motherboard has NVMe support. This would allow us to just connect that right there, give us some really fast storage. And of course I would need to uh, cinch it down with the little screw right there. Um, but these are of course much more expensive. So if you're just trying to get yourself up and running, uh, you're not gonna suffer too much, or in fact at all really when it comes to practical performance by going with a more normal SATA SSD like this one, but just wanted to point out that M.2 drives are an option as well. Next up is gonna be memory. And the memory that we're using today was specifically chosen so it can be compatible with our APU and our motherboard. So my recommendation for memory is first off, brace yourself because memory prices, just like GPU prices are very high right now. It might be expensive for you to get your memory, but double check the compatibility support list from your motherboard manufacturer and then choose memory that's 2933 as far as the speed goes or faster. This is 3200 speed, but since your uh, graphics is gonna be using this memory as well, you wanna make sure you have at least decent speed there. 2933 is kind of my starting off points. And as always, you can double check your motherboard's compatibility list for memory to make sure that whatever you get is gonna slot into the motherboard and just work. Um, and you won't have to mess around with a bunch of settings or that kind of thing. 
So that's four of our main components, motherboard, CPU, storage, memory. The remaining three are graphics card, case, and power supply. So for graphics card, I have one right here. It is a Vega 56. And let me just tell you guys, the graphics card prices are really, really, really expensive right now. But that is why we're not gonna be using one in today's build. And that is one of the advantages that you get with an APU. Now you're not gonna get the same amount of graphics card performance out of the APU as you would with a discrete graphics card. But the nice thing is you can use this system for now and then wait and once graphics card prices hopefully come down, you've got a PCI Express by 16 slot down here at the bottom. You can buy a graphics card, slot it into this motherboard, and that is what we call an upgrade path. Now the last two components are power supply and case, and I saved them for last. One, because they tend to have a little bit less of an impact on the actual performance of your system. So any reasonable power supply is gonna be 80 plus bronze rated or better, uh, and there's lots of options out there. I believe the one we're gonna be using today is an EVGA. This is an older one, so I'm just using that for an example. And then the last thing we're missing is a case. So like I already mentioned, Mini ITX is the form factor of our motherboard. We want a Mini ITX case to go along with that. And a case is where you can really kind of make your choice when it comes to aesthetics, because cases uh, often are an aesthetic choice. People choose cases that they think look pretty if they're gonna have their computer, up on their, uh, their computer up on their desk or something like that. It should also be functional enough, so it should have airflow. Uh, and I think for today, I'm gonna do things a little bit differently. We're gonna take a quick field trip over to Fry's, and I'm going to see what mini ITX cases they have there, and I'll pick one that I think looks good. Case in point, we decided to quickly stop and check the graphics card supply here at Fry's, and um, it looks like they're pretty much sold out. The 1080 Ti's would be down there for about $1,000. Here's where they're selling GTX 1060s for $400, and down here we have a few GT 730s and, and a GT 1030 that are in stock, so. If you're looking for a mid-range or high-end graphics card, they're really nowhere to be found right now, which is why an APU is actually a pretty good choice. Hopefully, prices will drop at some point in the future, and then if you're building the system that I'm talking about today, you can buy a reasonably priced graphics card if they ever come back in stock, and then drop it into the system we're putting together. Let's check out cases, though. This is the Core V1, and it is a mini ITX case, and I have actually never built in it. So I think this will get the job done. All right, guys, we're back from Fry's. Uh, we had some lunch, and now we're ready to build. So the case we decided on was the Core V1. This is from Thermaltake. It's a $50 case, and it was actually one of the only mini ITX cases that they had there at Fry's. There were a few other ones, but they were crappy, so this is one, the one we decided on. Parts list, of course, is in the video's description again. And I've gone ahead and taken everything here and priced everything. And if you exclude the memory, the parts list we're looking at right now is about $365. Now the memory, if you get a 16 gig kit and you want fast memory and you want something that's compatible with Ryzen, is gonna cost about $200 right now, which is pretty expensive. You can get a single eight gig kit, eight gig stick instead, which will sort of tide you over. You can get by for about $100. So ultimately, this entire system build is gonna cost you somewhere between $475 and $575, depending on how much memory you put in it. Beyond the memory though, we also have a power supply, of course, I've just gone with the Cooler Master V650. In the parts list, I've actually chosen a 550 watt, 80 plus bronze rated power supply from Corsair, that's about $50. That will get you by just fine. I'm using this one because it's what I have on hand. Beyond that though, all the rest of the parts are the same ones that I've listed off, so it is time to get building. If you're building at home, you're pretty much only going to need one key piece of hardware technology, and that is a screwdriver, Phillips head screwdriver. Now, we might be using a few other things as I go on here, so I'll tell you guys those things as I move forward with them. But for the time being, we're gonna go ahead and start by preparing the motherboard. And I'm already bringing in another piece of equipment and that is just a soft rubber mat. Uh, try to build on a non-conductive surface. Wood works just fine. A cardboard box is just fine. Just don't build on a metal surface like a table or something like that. Getting our motherboard unpacked, we're gonna have inside the motherboard itself, of course. And we're gonna have a few accessories that we want to keep ready to use. This is the IO shield, the input output shield, and that kind of lines up with the back of the motherboard. We'll install that in the case before we put the motherboard in. We're gonna need a single serial ATA cable, and that is to connect up our SSD. And then we're also going to need 
the Wi-Fi adapter. Since this motherboard includes Wi-Fi, uh, this is the antenna, and that's just so once we actually get the system up and running, we can connect that up in order to connect it to Wi-Fi, download Windows and Windows updates and all that good stuff. Next, we'll unbox our processor. I've already used this one, which is why the seal is broken, but I repacked it to give you guys the exact same experience. Inside, we have our processor itself and our heatsink fan. This is the Wraith Spire heatsink fan. And apart from the heatsink fan itself, you're gonna definitely need to have some thermal paste. Now, if you're buying this brand new, you'll have some thermal paste pre-applied on the bottom of the Wraith Spire cooler. So that's what we're gonna use today. It's already pre-applied, so you don't have to worry about it. Just don't touch it before you install the processor and get the uh, heatsink fan installed as well. Next up, our CPU, and that comes in a little clamshell. Keeps it protected. Until you're ready to install this, probably keep it in here. And again, bear in mind, there are a bunch of pins on the bottom of the CPU, and those are fairly delicate, so you don't wanna bend those or anything like that. Uh, the CPU itself can be handled by the edges, most ideally. Uh, you want to minimize contact with the top here, as well as the pins on the bottom, and that's simply to keep oils from your fingers to getting all over it and that kind of thing. Um, but all we're gonna really be paying attention to is the orientation of the pins, of course, and then you're gonna wanna look at the corner, and on one corner here, you actually have a tiny little uh, uh, golden triangle. That golden triangle is very important. So keep an eye where that golden triangle is, and then take a look at your AM4 socket down here on the motherboard itself. You're gonna have a little lever arm on the side, so just uh, pull that out ever so slightly and lift it up. That will open the socket, and it's ready for the CPU now. Take the gold triangle of the CPU, line it up with a triangle that's sort of in the edge of the socket. So with the two corners lined up so they're in the same corner, just set the CPU straight down on top of the socket and it'll drop down into place. This is what is known as a zero insertion force socket, which means you don't need to press down on that at all. If it doesn't drop in for you like mine did, just lift it up, flip it over, and take a gander at the pins on the underneath. You can look at them from, a, from the edge, just to make sure they're all straight. If they're not straight, uh, I'll link a video where I go over some basic tips on uh, actually correcting that and straightening out some motherboard pins. But it should just drop in like that, and if it does, go ahead and lower that little lever arm. That will hold it in place. It's not 100% secure, but it's secure enough for now for us to move on to the next step, which is to get the actual uh, heatsink fan ready to mount. Okay, I've added yet another little piece of uh, hardware here, and that is just a electric screwdriver. I'm just cheating a little bit. Uh, this mount for the AM4 socket will actually come with four screws and a couple little plastic retention brackets. And these are actually made for the older style of heatsink fans that AMD used to make. And even though they don't make that style anymore, they still have left that on there. Those actually screw into a backplate piece. So if I lift the motherboard up, you can see that backplate. And that backplate is what uh, we're gonna install the heatsink fan to. So that should stay in place, but bear in mind there's nothing holding it there right now, so you might have to kind of position it there as you mount the heatsink fan. If you lay everything flat, it should line up just as we're looking at right now. So to mount our heatsink fan, uh, again, pretty much just gonna line up the screws with where they go there. And uh, bear in mind, you've got a little cable coming off the side of this, and that is to plug in the fan. So you should kind of reality check here as well and make sure where you're gonna plug that in. It should be labeled as CPU fan header. On this particular motherboard, it's located right over here, a little gray plug. Um, so just bear in mind, you're gonna need to route the cable over to that and make sure you have enough cable length in order to order to do that. So I've just set the heatsink fan on top, four screws have lined up. I'm gonna start by just giving a couple turns to each screw to get it threaded onto that back plate behind the motherboard. You don't wanna tighten one corner down before you start the other screws. Uh, that'll make it harder to get the other screws started in the threading on the back plate. And it will also potentially put disproportionate force on one corner of the CPU which isn't a huge deal, but something you should watch out for. Once you've got them started, you can go ahead and uh, go with opposite corners one at a time, and you can tighten each one down. And you can tighten those down tight, not too tight, but they can be pretty snug on there. Beyond that, we just got our cable hanging off there, and I'm just going to wrap that around and plug it in to the CPU fan header. And the other thing we can do right now while we've got the motherboard out and easily accessible is install our system memory. This is G-Scale Flare X memory, which is specifically made for Ryzen. Uh, Ryzen processors can occasionally be finicky with what memory you connect, it, uh, connect up to it, 
a lot of most memory is compatible, but running at higher frequencies can be more challenging. So G-Skill specifically made this memory to be compatible with this platform. Um, all you need to do to install the memory though, as I've been talking and not explaining what I'm doing, is make sure that you have this central notch here lined up with the central notch on the memory slot. It is slightly offset, so they only go in one way. Uh, so just double check that to make sure that it is lining up properly. Each edge will fit into the slot on either side and it'll kind of sit like that and then you just need to push firmly down on both sides and it'll kind of snap into place. It gives a very satisfying snap and these little catches on the side will pop up and hold it in. So our motherboard is pretty much good to go. We're gonna set this aside and start working on the case. So once you've got your case out of the box, uh, you know, give it a once over, make sure everything is uh, not damaged. This case is very small, very boxy, but you're basically gonna have two side panels on either side. Typically those are held on by thumb screws in the back, so you can just unscrew those to pop up the side panels to access the interior. And then as far as the layout goes, uh, the power supply is gonna go down here in the very bottom. The motherboard will actually sit flat in this central area, and then everything else kind of goes on top of it there. So first thing that you'll want to do is get rid of these thumb screws and start disassembling the case so we can access the interior. So I've removed all of our side panel pieces. Um, one thing I will say is if your side panels have clear plexiglass like this, they'll usually have plastic uh, over the top of it just to keep it from getting scratched up during shipping. These are really, really easy to scratch. So I recommend leaving that plastic on until the system is all put together, peeled off at the very end as sort of the finished product type thing. The things you're gonna wanna keep in mind are that almost every case is gonna come with a set of accessories like this. Typically it will have a manual, and if it's a case that's a unique design, you might want to double check there to see if anything mounts in a unique or strange fashion. You're also going to have uh, lots of screws, so the screws that you'll mount your motherboard with, screws that you'll mount additional hard drives with, or additional SSDs. You might have some standoffs that are specially made for mechanical hard drives and that kind of thing. And then often a set of zip ties, and these are just really hand handy for cable management. Beyond that, you're gonna have a set of cables that come out, and these are your front panel connectors. So you're gonna have one group that is uh, the most pain in the ass part of building a computer. This is what's gonna control uh, your actual power switch to turn the system on and off, reset switch, and LED lights for your hard drive activity and uh, your power activity. You also have this plug, which is known as HD Audio. This will allow you to have a mic and a headphone jack connected up at the front of your case. This case has a single fan, so it is connected via this three pin fan header. Finally, you have a USB 3.0 header. Uh, these are fairly large and bulky, but if you want USB 3.0 ports on the front of your case, this is the header that you will use. There's a newer header uh, beyond this that's called the USB 3.1 header that is different, so keep that in mind. There's a USB 3.0 and a 3.1. If you want 3.1, make sure your case has that header and your motherboard has that header. That's pretty new though, so you won't see those too often yet. And one final thing to point out, and this is just unique to this case, is that aside from the two side panels and top panel I've removed, there's a couple thumb screws here that also allow me to remove this bottom piece. And that's what I'm gonna need to remove to access the bottom chamber in order to install the power supply. Also bear in mind there is a dust filter down here, so uh, it's a little plastic and kind of got to work to get it off, but that will go just beneath your power supply so that as it, as it is running its fan to pull air in, it'll uh, suck up dust right there and you can pull that off in order to clean. Uh, having dust filtration in your computer is always, always nice to have. So the power supply supplies power and we're gonna need to install this. I like to get this installed first because this usually has the bulk of the cables. This is a fully modular power supply. So all the cables that plug into the computer are actually gonna go into these plugs right here. And all of those cables are included in the packaging and they're all separate. So the cables that we're gonna need for this build uh, is a couple for the motherboard. So we're gonna need a 24 pin main power connector for the motherboard. That's that one right there. And there's the corresponding plug on the motherboard. Bear in mind, there's a catch on one side of the plug and there's a, a little catch on one side of the plug on the motherboard too. So it will actually stay connected when you plug it in, like so. Ta-da, hey, that went in pretty easy. Uh, and then there's one other power plug on the motherboard. This is what is known as EPS power, supplemental CPU power. On this particular board, it's tucked away, kind of in not the most convenient position, but it's right up there. Uh, and this will sometimes be a four pin plug and sometimes it'll be an eight pin plug depending on how much power you have going to the processor. Uh, so on the uh, power supply side, you might have a split plug like this, an eight and an eight, but they just fit in here side by side and plug in 
like that. Now for the record, I'm plugging this stuff in outside of the case um, just to demonstrate it right here. I'm actually gonna unplug these when I install the power supply right now. Now aside from your main 24 pin, which is gonna connect up right there, and your supplemental CPU power, which is gonna connect up right there, you might also have what is known as PCI Express graphics, eight pin or six pin PCI Express graphics. Those will also connect up to these same eight pin plugs right here uh, that the CPU plug connects to. Just bear in mind that the other side of the plug is different. So these uh, are typically labeled PCI Express graphics. They're usually a six pin plug and then they have an optional two pins on the other end uh, that you can detach depending on the configuration of your graphics card. Since these are for graphics cards and we do not have a graphics card in this build, we do not need this cable. So we're not gonna use it, but I just wanted to point it out to you guys in case you are installing a graphics card in your system. Beyond that, we have uh, peripheral cables, hard drive SATA cables. There's four of those connectors on this power supply. Again, bear in mind this is modular, so the plugs on the power supply side might not look the same depending on the power supply that you're using. But the other sides, the sides that plug into the motherboard and your drives should always look the same. So these are SATA power plugs. Those will correspond with the SATA power plug on your SSD or your hard drive. And they do have a slight little L shape to them. So make sure that you plug them in the right way and with that L shape. It's pretty impossible to plug them in wrong, but bear in mind that the plugs are a little delicate, so make sure that you reality check that, that you're plugging it in the correct way. Beyond that, next to there, you have a uh, data connector, and that's where your SATA cable will go. Since we're already showing this, I might as well also show the SATA cable. There it is right there. One end connects up to your hard drive or SSD, like that. And then the other end of that SATA cable would plug into your motherboard. Finally, the last peripheral uh, connector you might spot is this little four pin guy. This is uh, typically referred to as a Molex plug and these are a little bit older, so you might not encounter them, but you will see them sometimes uh, for case fan connection, connecting up a pump for an all-in-one liquid cooler or something like that. Just bear in mind that you might have an additional plug set in your modular power supply uh, kit that allows you to connect up those connectors, but they won't always be needed. It just depends on what hardware you have in your system. All right, guys, I've pretty much laid out everything as far as the parts and how everything is connected. Now what we have to do is get it all installed in the case and then, of course, plug in those plugs into the plugs I just showed you that they plug into. I'm going to start off with the power supply just because that goes in the bottom down here. And uh, for that purpose, I've just flipped the case over entirely. And we'll drop that in like so. Uh, you can put your fan on your power supply facing uh, down or facing up. I usually try to face it to where there's a dust filter. Since there's a dust filter right there, that's the way I'm going to face this. At this point, since I already showed you which modular cables we need and we have easy access to the bottom of the power supply, I'm going to go ahead and connect those up. And now a move that I will probably come to regret, which is to uh, reinstall this bottom piece. I probably won't need to access it down there again, but you know, if, if things get tight, I can always pull this back off. Now I've routed all these cables uh, up here, kind of up, they're not where they need to be, but they're up here so I can see what's what. And then at the bottom here uh, is kind of the, where your motherboard will go. And there are four mounting points for this. One, two, three, and four. Bear in mind, since this is a mini ITX build, it's a very small. If you're using a larger, uh, like a micro ATX or a full size ATX uh, case, you might have five, six, seven, eight, or nine standoff points. But make sure you have standoffs or the raised mounting points there. You do not want to mount the motherboard directly to the case. Forgetting standoffs is, uh, Something, I don't know how common it is, but it's definitely something you want to avoid because it can damage uh, your hardware if it's not done properly. Remember the IO shield? That lines up with the inputs and outputs on the back of the motherboard. So just like that, but it's got to go in the case. And for the case, make sure I have this little knockout part right here. If we line that up and apply pressure from the inside, it should pop into place. Depending on the quality of your IO shield, sometimes this can be challenging, especially if the metal is flexing or that kind of thing. Uh, use the butt of a screwdriver from the inside to push it into place if you have any trouble. Now that that is installed, we shall take our pre-prepared motherboard with the CPU and heatsink fan and memory already installed. Take that IO and line it up with the IO shield that you just also installed. And then your four mounting points should line up with the four holes in your mini ITX motherboard. 
Now, if you're looking at the screws that came with your uh, case, you might notice that some have this kind of finer thread like on the right here, and some have the kind of rougher thread like on the left here. The standoffs for your motherboard may be either one, so it's good to reality check beforehand. I actually got it right on the first try, it was the rough thread. UNC632. Okay, one more piece of hardware to put in the case, and then we just gotta plug everything in. Uh, this is a 2.5 inch drive, so most SSDs are gonna be 2.5 inch drives like this one, unless you get an M.2 like I showed you guys at the beginning. And then you might have larger drives, 3.5 inch drives. Uh, here's an example of one of those. These are much bigger and they're usually mechanical drives and they, are, they spin and they make noise and stuff like that. Uh, if you have one of those, it will be able to slot into a 3.5 inch drive mount. And this case happens to have two of those. These are held on, on by a little thumb screw. So with the touch of finagling, I was able to remove that tray. Um, and this tray would be able to support a 3.5 inch drive like that one. And then sometimes the drives will mount through the sides. And uh, if you're using a spinning drive like this one, you'd probably want to make use of these little, these little rubber grommets here. And then screw the drive in through that. That will provide a little bit of dampening uh, for, the, for the noise that a spinning mechanical hard drive might make. Or if you don't want to worry about your system making any noise with spinning mechanical hard drives, just go with all SSDs. Typically an SSD can mount to that same tray. Uh, it's also got mounts through the bottom. So we're gonna do that. I mentioned the fine thread and the thick thread. This is where that fine threaded screw is gonna go. This is an M3. It took me a sec, but it got there. So there's our last piece of hardware that needed to be mounted, now mounted. So guys, at this point, um, I'm gonna go ahead and start plugging stuff in, but for those of you who might be building a system like this with a graphics card, I wanted to point out that this is where you would install the graphics card and it would go in this slot down here at the bottom. This is known as a PCI Express graphics by 16 slots. It would basically line up like that. You'd slot in the PCI Express graphics slot down there at the bottom. Uh, you're also, of course, gonna need to remove uh, these two little brackets here at the back, and then there's uh, usually some mounting mechanism at the top that will hold that all in place. And then, of course, just connect up your PCI Express graphic power to that, and you'd be all set to go. But again, we're not using a graphics card today, so we don't need to worry about that. So let's begin. Power plugs, 24 pin. There we go. Any excess cable, I'm just going to kind of feed back and try to tuck down here into this bottom section. Bottom section is our cable junk area where we will put as much extra cable junk as possible. We also have uh, the need for a SATA power connector over here for the SSD, so I'll go ahead and plug that in. While we're here again, let's go ahead and connect up the SSD's data connection via our little SATA cable here. A little clasp should pop into place. So we now have power and data going to the SSD. Power is connected to the power supply. Data cable from the SSD here to the plug on the motherboard that is directly behind it. We also have that awkwardly placed 8-pin supplemental CPU power. Next is our HD audio cable. This plugs in right up here, kind of near where that CPU power connector was. All of these uh, connectors on the motherboard are all labeled on the motherboard itself. But the motherboard manual is actually a really, really good resource to go to if you're not positive where the actual plugs might plug into. Other than that, we just have the USB 3 and this uh, extra fan plug for our front intake fan. So I mentioned how much I hate front panel connectors. They're always really annoying. These are, if you can see, they're kind of color-coded right there. Uh, the nine or so pins that I'm sort of trying to point towards. Oh, that's really challenging. Anyway, they're all right there, they're all labeled, and I'm going to attempt to plug them in. Making this even more difficult is the fact that some of them are labeled plus or minus, positive or negative. The LEDs, power LED and uh, hard drive LED, are the only uh, pins you need to worry about that plus minus on. Uh, everything else doesn't matter if it's plugged in one way or the other. All right, those front panel connectors sure were annoying, but as you maybe can see, most of the cables going over to plug into the motherboard are kind of in this area right here. Beyond that, you will probably notice kind of a rat's nest of cables that's just down here in the front, up in front of the power supply. That's not a big deal, because most of the air is coming in from the front of, this, front of the case, 
and it's going to be flowing up here and over most of your components that you're worried about. Uh, beyond that, I can go ahead and start putting the panels back on. So here's the top panel. Now, if you're a superstitious person, then you should not put this final side panel back on. Leave at least one side panel off until you've started the system up. Make sure it's up and running. And now, as far as I can tell, this computer is all put together. So I'm going to flip the switch on on the power supply in the back, and then I will test the power switch right up here in the front. Fans spin up. I've got an LED that's lit up on the side right here as well. And if you happen to have any LEDs that are uh, part of your motherboard, for example, like my uh, AB350N Wi-Fi motherboard from Gigabyte has some red LEDs on it, you should see those light up as well. Fan spinning though, that's always a good thing. And uh, that's pretty much all there is to it when it comes to assembling a computer like this. I will say, there's one last part I wanna do right here. I am now allowed to do this. And with that, we have a functional gaming PC, and we didn't even have to spend $1,000 on a $250 graphics card. So that's pretty nice. Uh, I like that. Also, really like the fact that you could pop in a discrete graphics card to this system and upgrade it if they become more affordable in the future. I also like the fact that since this is an AM4 chipset motherboard, right now we've got a quad core in there. There's eight core, like 1800X CPUs available for this same platform. So you could upgrade in the future to a system with a discrete graphics card and an eight core CPU with 16 threads, which would give you a ton of performance for gaming, gaming and streaming, doing video editing at the same time. So a lot of versatility and flexibility in this system as well as this platform, which is why I was pretty excited that AMD was actually bringing these Raven Ridge APUs to market, especially learning that the 2200G is only $99 for the CPU and the GPU together in one. But guys, if you enjoyed this video, definitely hit the thumbs up button. If you're at a loss for what to do next, I will link my first five things to do with a new PC build in this video's description. That will take you to the next steps of getting Windows loaded, making sure your BIOS is set up correctly, making sure any drives that you add on there are set up properly as well. And there's a follow-up video where you can work on setting up Steam and getting your games loaded and that sort of thing too. Thank you so much for watching this video though, guys. Share it with your friends if you think that they would like to build a new computer like this as well. And of course, hit that thumbs up button on the way out if you enjoyed it. We'll see you guys in the next video.